Jen is a technology and startup expert and a graduate of Dartmouth College. He currently serves as chairman and CEO of Tech 2000, a provider, a provider of advanced technology training and mobile service device software to government and Fortune 500 companies, and as chairman of Boris Systems, an IT professional services firm, and chairman of Opus 8, a private investment and strategic advisory firm. Tiana also serves on a number of other boards and clubs, including the Maryland Venture Fund Authority, the Potomac Officers Club, and the Washington, D.C. Arch Angels, to name a few. Tiana is a recognized expert in customer relationship management, direct marketing, and business process outsourcing. He co-founded CyberRep, which at the time was one of the largest privately held outsourcing companies. Today, CyberRep ACS is a division of Xerox with over $1.5 billion in revenue. Tian has also received a number of awards and recognitions high highlighting his successes. In 2001, he received the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and in 2003, he received the Ernst & Young Performance Excellence Award. He's also one of the 2012 Washington Business Journal Power 100, a three-time Smart CEO Magazine Smart 100, as one, and was one of the Gazette of Politics and Business's 25 CEOs you need to know. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tian. Thanks so much. Thank you guys for having me. Um, Emma failed to mention that I'm a dropout of Georgetown Law. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you guys are clapping wide. <laughs> um, well, it's a pleasure to, to be here, and uh, Jeff is not here. Usually when Jeff has me in here, I'll, we'll do like a fireside chat. But he asked me to talk to you guys a little bit about my story and, you know, how I got, you know, to where we're... I am, and a little bit about my background, and also talk about the case study of the company that Emma had mentioned, which was CyberRep, which wound up growing to be a pretty large company, and um, to intersperse the importance of networking into that. And I just found out that you guys, um, this is your 11th class, it's your last class, so um, hopefully we'll make it interactive and fun. You can jump in with questions anytime you want. We're going to run for about uh, 35 minutes, and then we can go to Q&A for 20 minutes or so. So um, I don't have a clicker, so let's just go ahead and get started. This is my contact info, by the way. And I also, my last slide will have that. Feel free to contact me at any time. My colleague, Brady Nelson, is here, too. And we're on Facebook Live, too, so Tian Wong page. You can see Facebook Live, or you can go back to the videotape later uh, at your convenience. But um, as Emma had said, I'm, I'm an angel investor, an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur in residence here at McDonough School, and I've been here now. This is my fourth year, and uh, I love it. You know, I'm here. I have office hours three, four times a month. So if you guys want to meet offline, we can meet in person. I have office hours today from one to three, for example. Also, Chalk Talk I recommend, which is something that Jeff and Alyssa have put, to, put in place, which is wonderful. Uh, that's at 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock every Tuesday night. And you know you can talk to Jeff about it if you want. If you guys have a business idea you want to explore, just, it's a great way to get involved and, and meet. You know, usually there's three or four entrepreneurs and residents there at a, at a particular Chalk Talk session. So just a great way to get some practitioner feedback. Uh, chairman of a couple of tech companies, which you can look up later and CEO of an investment advisory firm called Opus 8, which was a company I started after I sold my business in 2003, set up an investment business, wound up doing a couple dozen angel investments, and then we got involved in advisory work, and we helped private equity funds and venture capital funds raise capital, um, mostly offshore, through offshore institutional and family office investors. And then I wanted to bring up, Jeff wanted me to talk about Connectpreneur, which is, an, uh, it's a, it's a community that we've built over the last six years. We do six events a year, two in Baltimore, two in Bethesda, and two in um, Northern Virginia. And we bring together 500 or so leading business leaders and investors. And we have pitch events, we have a fireside chat with a local uh, or regional VIP CEO like Steve Case has spoken, Governor McCollum from Virginia has been a guest, David Trump here in Maryland. Um, and I want to offer a complimentary invitation to you guys as well. So if you want to go, our next one's November 16th in Baltimore. I know that's a haul. Uh, but the next local one would be December 13th in Falls Church, Virginia at the Marriott. And if you guys want to go, just talk to Reagan after class or shoot us an email and, 
and we'll make sure you guys are registered. And um, Jeff usually comes and usually brings, we usually have half a dozen, eight Georgetown MBA and undergrads come to each event. So we want to give back to the community that way as well. Uh, just really quick on my background, I'm from New Jersey originally, born in the U.S. My parents are immigrants. My All of my grandparents are from China. My dad was from China and moved to the U.S., went to college, and uh, he basically started a Chinese restaurant. So I started working in the restaurant at a very young age and you know, learned the hard lessons of uh, the importance of hard work and the importance of making your customer really happy. And those are two lessons that I'm really grateful for because I try to apply that into everything that I do. And I have done to everything that I've done. Um, I went to college in New Hampshire at Dartmouth and uh, started a couple businesses in college. Um, I was doing custom printed painter hats and delivering Chinese food late at night. Had a business where we were selling Chinese food. You know, the college is in a small town, so all the restaurants closed early. So we would open up late at night and, and, and have a limited menu of egg rolls and fried rice and deliver that to people late at night. <laughs> <laughs> Made a lot of money for a college kid. That was great. Um, but I, I just sort of had the entrepreneurial bug. I never, my dad had restaurants. I mean, I never really worked. I never was exposed to corporate America, you know, uh, where you know some people in my family were either lawyers or worked at a bank or whatever. So I didn't know any other type of upbringing. So basically, you know, you are what you grow up with, and you are the sum of your experiences, and uh, and I am as well. So I didn't have any sort of grand plan to uh, to get into corporate America and, and build a 25, 30 year career. I just knew I would have my business someday. I was agnostic to the industry and just kind of was very opportunistic trying to figure out, you know, where can I add value? Where can I, where can I, um, you know, where are the pockets of opportunity? And then go from there. Um, I have a question for you guys, because I see Ron here. How many of you all are entrepreneurs or planning to be an entrepreneur? So about a third of the class. Um, how many are currently running a business or an entrepreneurial endeavor at the moment? Yeah, being okay. Yeah, so we have a few. That's great. Um, well, you know, I, I gotta say, plugging entrepreneurs, and you guys are taking this class for a reason, right? For those of you who are not entrepreneurs yet, or um, I think you're studying to be a doctor, Michael. Right? I'm a biotechnology. Oh, biotech. Okay. You know, it's um, it's a heck of a heck of a way to. Yeah, it's it's a great it's a great um, it's great. <laughs> you know, it's great from a lot of different perspectives. You're sort of the master of your own destiny. You you are you know you set the tone. Um, you are serving your customer directly. There's no less politics. There's less uh, friction, if you will. It's a hard life. It's very hard. It requires tremendous amounts of grit and endurance, mental endurance, and the ability to withstand tremendous amounts of stress and um, disappointment. But if you can get through that, the reward, the flip side of that coin is that the feeling of satisfaction you get um, is really incomparable because you know you can look back on your effort and say, wow, you know, I made it through there. Um, wanted to talk about the case study, Jeff, Jeff really likes me to talk about this company. I, I founded the business with two friends, two other friends. Uh, it was three guys in a garage. Each one of us went into $50,000 of credit card debt. And we started this business to, to answer the phones or to make phone calls on behalf of people. So the three of us, the three founders, were involved in a business. Uh, we were all involved in, in sales, basically, over the phone. At the time, there was no social media, there were no cell phones, there was no email. It was all pick up the phone and call and try to get meetings and appointments and go see people. And it was a different way to sell. So we all hated using the phone, and we said, well, I bet we hate using the phone. We hate dialing for dollars, they used to call it, or, or you know, getting rejected a lot. Other people must hate it. So we wound up hiring some friends from the real estate industry where we all were from and uh, and just started going down the yellow pages and calling companies and saying, hey, do you, um, you know, we, we just set up a new business to make phone calls on an outsourced basis, although the word outsourcing didn't exist at the time. 
um, will you hire us? And Pepco, a local utility company, called us and they said, well, we don't need anyone to make phone calls, we need people to answer the phones for us. And we said, well, we do that too. So our initial, uh, our initial business was immediately pivoted and thank God for Pepco because they gave us a three-year contract that basically put us in business. But I would say this as an entrepreneur, um, as, as you guys are entrepreneurs, really you have a big advantage if you're solving a problem or a pain point that you yourself have experienced. In other words, if you're the primary customer or ideal customer target avatar of your business idea, you have a big advantage because you kind of know. You know what you're, what you, what's going to work, and you know what's not going to work. So, um, I found that in my experience, in terms of as an investor and, and doing business, um, you know, I've had the best success or the best results in areas where I have deep domain expertise around the, the sort of pain point that's being solved. So, anyway, um, we Pepco gave us a contract. We started small, ten people, twenty people, and then we wound up growing over time. Being in Northern Virginia was a big advantage because that's where the telecommunications. Um, hi, how are you? Come on in. Um, the telecommunications boom was going on in Northern Virginia, and uh, we were able to pick up some customers in in the telecommunications space. And we wound up growing and serving the customers very, very well, going bending over backwards. We differentiated. You know, we had call centers, um, which call, call center didn't exist. The, the word call center didn't exist back then. You guys all know what a call center is, right? So uh, that's basically what we were, a call center company. And uh, we differentiated because we hired college graduates. We paid full benefits. We did a lot of things that our competitors didn't do. And, as a result, we provided a better service, and we were able to charge more money once we once we you know convinced the customer of a value proposition. And it was uh, it was a nice business. We raised three rounds of capital. Not going to talk much about that, but I'm, I'm happy to talk about capital anytime. But we raised a total of twenty, a little over twenty million dollars with a, uh, a company called Allied Capital, which was a publicly traded business development corporation. It's no longer around today, but they were based in D.C. They wound up owning about a third of the company, and then we sold the business to a public company called ACS in '03. And ACS was a Fortune 500. They were then bought by Xerox. But just the next chart will show you the trajectory of growth in terms of how many locations we had, how much revenue we had, and how many employees we had. So when I sold the business, we were 80 million with 2,200 employees in nine locations. And three years later, as part of ACS, the company just exploded. Our biggest customer went from 50 million to 400 million. Just one customer alone with this group. Um, and you can see the number of these were nine domestic U.S. call centers. There were no international. This, out of these 35, I would say uh, a third or more were international, different countries. So we sold to a company that already had operations in other countries. And you know, if you look back um, on this, was a great story. You know, by the way, so Xerox bought ACS in 2012, and they were up to almost two billion. I think they probably exceeded two billion since then. And then last year, Xerox spun off a subsidiary called Conduit. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, it's another public company that uh, a lot of my former team are still there and uh, thriving. They're doing very well. But that was a spin off that Xerox had. Um, uh, where's my other slide? Shoot. Uh, anyway, I, I had another slide called, you know, like if I had to distill why, why I think we did very well. Um, I would distill it into three things, three things that really contributed to our success here. Number one is our you know, obsessive focus on the customer and um, just making sure that we, you know, our, we had a top ten values you know, of the company and number one was attitude is everything, number two was, was customer goals are our goals and we really lived that and I think it's very important as an entrepreneur whether you're doing a services business or a product business is to, you know, everything else except the customer's desire is noise, I think. You know, it, it, the only thing that matters is what the customer thinks and being able to, you know, get a third party to pay for your product or service. And, um, you know, you can have the best money, you can have the best people, you can have the best technology, 
But you don't have a business until you have a customer. So you got an inferior product. I mean, look at Microsoft. They had an inferior product for many, many years, but they grew because they had customers, you know? Um, so it's not about having the best product. It's not about having the best people. Those are important, but more important, you need to have customers that are happy. That's, that's one reason, I think. And I got that from the restaurant business and just kind of knowing that in the restaurant business, if you're not performing every day, people are going to say bad things about you or they're not going to show up and you'll be out of business pretty quick. So the second thing, um, you know, the second key, I think, to, to our success was um, what I would call continual, uh, continual improvement mindset, where no matter how well we did, we always knew we could be better. And, you know, that's... Good and it's bad. Some of the bad with that mentality is that we didn't celebrate success as much as I wish we had. In hindsight, you know, we we're constantly driving for more and more and more, and better and better and better. And the benefit was that the customers were happy and the company grew. The negative is that we turned a lot of people, a lot of good people, because we just weren't celebrating success. You know, we would win the game and then we would not really celebrate. We'd be like, well, why didn't we win by more points? You know. So, uh, but I think that, that that is a big contributing factor to how we won, how we were successful. And the third one was network. And um, that's what I think Jeff wanted me to talk about today. I have five keys of networking, and I want to talk about the importance of that. Um, but we would not have grown like that if it weren't for our relationships, you know. And our relationships, particularly with our largest customer. And, you know, we, my largest customer was uh, Nextel, which, whose chief service officer used to be a competitor of ours. And we served together on a trade association for many years, and we wound up developing friendship and a lot of mutual trust because we went through some adversity together with the organization. But the point is that back then, you didn't really cooperate with your competitors. You were sort of fighting your competitors. so. Uh, but because we were able to network and build a relationship, things happened and she wound up going from being the president of this large company to being the chief service officer of what became our biggest customer. And that trust level is the reason why we were successful. And, you know, I can't overstate, when I was growing up, you know, I'm a little older than you guys, uh, the thing was like, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Have you heard that before? Yes. Do you guys believe that, or do you not believe that? Totally. You do believe it? Yeah. You know, it's funny, because I used to think, well, why, you know, I just couldn't understand that for a while, until I was in my mid-20s, maybe. It was like, God, I, I can win by knowing more than the other guy, or by being smarter than the other person. Um, and, uh, you know, today, it's definitely, I, I even believe it more than I did back then, you know, 25, 30 years ago. It's all about who you know, really, today, when you think about it. Because what you know is commodity. So what you know is a three-second Google search away. It's a Wikipedia entry away. You know, So you might have competitive knowledge, Michael, but hey, man, I can just go on, online and get exactly what you know, and more than you know. And if I don't, I can hire a bunch of researchers in Pakistan or South Africa or wherever, Bangladesh, and get, my, get what I need faster and cheaper. So information is complete, com completely commoditized now, especially with the advent of artificial intelligence, I think. Um, but what is not really hackable is your inter interconnections, your personal relationship one-on-one -on -one with a person. That's really not automatable. And that's why I think now more than ever, it's super important, you know, really, really important. And um, I believe also that your network is your net worth. Um, not necessarily financially, but that your network will contribute to your net worth as a person. So in terms of your fulfillment, your knowledge, your experience in life, and so on. Sorry, go ahead, Pat. No, sorry. Well, I, before you jump to networking, I was just curious about the last slide. Yes. Um, the, so was it your relationship, were you bought by ACS in 2006 after you grew to the six? Six hundred fifty yeah. million. We were bought here in two thousand three. And three. So was it? Yeah. So so also may have been like your relationship and the synergy with that that skyrocketed you 
Because you went 45, I mean, you're obviously growing incredibly well. Yes. But to go from 80 to 600 is, is like incredible. Over time, though, that was three years. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was not about the relationship piece. That was about, um, that was about just tremendous execution on yeah. the part of ACS and also our team. Yeah, and the growth of that one. So that was year. organic growth. Yeah, that that customer. No, it's not 100% organic. Maybe 100 of it was inorganic. All right. was through. It's still a lot. It's yeah. still a lot. Yeah. You went from 80 to 500. So you're looking at tremendous, you know, um, really amazing growth. Um, and I can't take credit for, for after selling, but I can give credit to my team because they, they're the ones that made it happen. No, no, no that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, back to the networking piece. Um, so I have like five keys to networking, and you know I don't profess to be an expert in networking at all, but I do. Uh, I do kind of. I'm a big proponent of networking, and I work with a lot of young folks here at Georgetown. And my advice to them is just keep building your network because you know your network is it's portable. It's per first of all, it's permanent. So the, the bonds you guys are making as MBA students here will be forever. So you guys will be 80 years old having whiskey and a cigar, and you'll be reminiscing about the time you were 30 years old in business school class, you know? Because it's, it's permanent. And you guys are gonna wind up running, who knows? You, know, you guys are gonna be very successful, and you'll be you know, kind of rising, rising along with each other. And also it's portable. The, your network is portable. So in other words, if you're working at a company developing biotechnology, say, right? Uh, what you're developing for that company is their property. But the relationships you're building are your property. So that's why, additionally, networking is very important because it's a portable asset. And when you go look for a job, for those of you who are not going to be entrepreneurs, um, you know, one of the differentiating factors, I believe, today um, and also in, into the future for your job security is going to be the quality and the quantity of your network. Like that's going to be a crucial differentiator for an employer. So if someone's going to hire you and they have a choice of six candidates and the six candidates are all equally good, if you will, you know, one of the differentiators will be, you know, hey, Adam's got this massive network, you know, and, and it's deep too. He's got all these recommendations on LinkedIn and, and, you know, pretty soon you'll be able to do a lot of diligence on individuals, much more than you can today. Um, so me as an employer, I'll be able to see Adam. Wow, he's, this guy's really focused. He's connected in these areas, perfect fit. Good, let's go with him. That's sort of going to be uh, something that's even going to be more valuable than your own resume. So, you know, I would definitely keep that in mind. For those of you who hate networking, um, you know, and I'm an introvert, you know, you, you have to get over the fact that, uh, that, that, that it's painful. Because <laughs> it is painful, you know, but it's necessary Sort of like that test you have to take, or the, you know, these whatever stuff of working out is distasteful, right? Going to the gym every day, but it's good for your health, you know, things like that. So you have to look at it like that. It's not optional anymore, it's really mandatory. So I have like five keys to networking, and the first is to learn to love your grind. Like it's, I was just saying, as an introvert, it's hard, but I've had to learn to love it. You know, what, what aspects do I like about it? I like knowing that I'm growing. I like knowing that I'm learning. I'm meeting new people. I'm enhancing my value to the marketplace. Um, and if, for you extroverts, you already love this stuff. So, you know, and, or, who, who's an extrovert in here? So, and who's an introvert? So we have maybe a little more introverts than extroverts, I think, but um, the extroverts have a big advantage because they love this stuff. So they're going to go out there and hustle and, and go to three, three events a night, which is good for them. But, um, you know, the second one is to be patient. So, you know, building a network is like gardening. It's like, it takes time. It'll never happen overnight. It takes time. It takes a lot, long time, a lot of coffees, a lot of conversations, a lot of ball games, a lot of dinners. But over time, you'll wake up and you'll say, wow, man, you know, I've got this great group of people. But if you try to expect results right away, you'll be disappointed. You might get a few people you'll meet. You can you know, monetize a relationship or, or help each other quickly. But generally speaking, um, you know, this is, networking is a game of patience. 
you know, you're building something that's very lasting. And anytime you build something that's lasting and good, it takes time to build that foundation first. And the third thing I would say is keep it real. By that I mean be authentic, be yourself, don't try to be fake, don't try to, you know, be, be someone who you're not. Because A, people don't like fake people. And B, people can see right through it anyway, eventually, generally, sooner rather than later. So um, there's no, and I think there's a real big push towards authenticity on social media. I'm pretty active on social, and there's just a lot of, uh, the mentality is, you know, just be yourself, put yourself out there, open up your soul a little bit, show some vulnerability, and that will help you um, connect better with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, give before you get is number four. Um, again, if you go into a relationship with the mentality of tit for tat, I'm going to help you, you're going to help me, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. I don't think that works as well as, I'm just going to help JD, I'm going to help Pat, I'm going to help Nina, I'm going to give them advice, make introductions for them, and I don't expect anything in return because I might get something from Heather or, you know, Guillermo. Maybe I'll get something from them later in return because sort of if you're putting good positive energy and um, good karma into the universe or whatever you want to call it, eventually you'll get it back. You know, like what goes around comes around. That's such a true thing. And I don't know if you guys are old enough to have experienced it, but I, I certainly am. And if you do good things to whomever, you're going to get good stuff happening to you from wherever. So if you have a mentality of giving um, and truly enjoying giving, you know, and helping people, because you get a lot out of helping people. Um, you know, you really do. And, uh, you know, if you go into it with that, that helps you with number two. It helps you be patient, too. And then the last one, the fifth, the fifth key is giving true value. And by that I mean... Um, when you're helping somebody, you know, just try to understand. It's, it's all about listening and communicating and trying to understand what it is that person wants or needs and how you can fill that need. And that's really true value. And everybody in this room has a special superpower. Everybody in this room does something or knows something or is capable of something that's world class. You know, like, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but Rob, I'm sure you do something or you, you know, you have a set of skills it's world class. I don't know what it is, but you know, you may not know what it is, but you know, everybody has something special they can get, whether it's, uh, you know, and if you're trying to get with, you know, a senior VP who's a buyer or a CEO, you know, you can give value, and value comes in a lot of different forms. Maybe it's a charity they're involved in. Maybe they have uh, a child or a relative who's got a rare illness, and you have knowledge about that, or it's an article you can share, or, or volunteering. You know, there's a lot of value that can be given to people that you may think are higher level than you. Um, so those are sort of my five keys to successful networking. And um, the last comment I have, I want to talk about weak links for a second, super connectors and LinkedIn. And I think I'm done with the general comments here. But um, so do you guys, who knows what a weak link is? Anyone want to take a crack at that? JP, what do you think? Oh, I wasn't. A weak link? <laughs> What's, are you paying attention or not? Yeah, okay. I know there's a TV show, but I haven't seen that either. A right. weak link, I'm going to go with um, uh, using a sports metaphor, uh, the least skillful person on the team is vulnerable. Okay, that's an interesting, yeah, not really. Uh, not for not working. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Um, What's it's a weak the, link? It's an acquaintance, not someone that you exactly. work with to right. work closely. Right. Very good, very good. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, for sports, you were correct. You know, the weak link on the team, you know, in the chain. So, but in, I think for networking, you know, like, um, there's there's first degree connections on LinkedIn, people that you're connected with, and and then there's second degree. Certainly second degree connections are considered weak, weak, weak links. And uh, first degree connections who you don't know very well. And basically is, the theory is, and there's been some research and some writing on this stuff, is that the weak links are the ones where you're going to get true value out of your network, not the strong links, not the people that you know, but the people that you don't know very well, because they may know some people. They may help you be able to get a job through an introduction or, or whatever. So don't. I guess the lesson with weak links is don't disregard them. You know, you know, consider them valuable. 
you should consider every, everyone in your network is really valuable, whether you know them or not, whether you know them well or, or not. They're all valuable. Um, super connectors are those rare individuals who are just amazing at connecting. They happen to be these centers of influence. They're supernovas, you know, like lots of gravity. Everyone gravitates to them. And those are people that you want to get to know. You want to get to know, identify. I'm sure there's super connectors right here in this room, in this building for sure. Those are the people that you want to develop relationships with because um, they have the ability to, they're just the center of so much activity that you know, you're going you're gonna to benefit in some way from that. So you want to identify who your super connectors are in this room. Who, who in this room is a super connector? Well, don't be shy. Well, we have a couple, <laughs> right? So whoever you all are, you know, you want to be connecting with each other um, with these super connectors. Because over time, you know, and, and the super connectors, you can identify who they are. Because they're the people that when they go in a room, and you walk in a room, they're the ones that are the center of attention. Or you look on their LinkedIn profile, they're the ones with 5,000 LinkedIn contacts. And so those are, the, those are very, very great people to get to know. And generally, if they're a super connector, they really enjoy connecting with people. So they will be very open to you. Now, as far as LinkedIn goes, how many of you guys are not on LinkedIn? Okay, how many? Two? <laughs> you guys got to get on LinkedIn. Uh, because it's, it's, you know, it's not like Facebook or Snapchat. You know, LinkedIn is a, is a professional social network. So it's where your peers are, it's where your employers are, it's where your customers are. It's where it's a tremendous tool. It's a it's just like view it like a ever changing address book that's self self updating, and it's a database, tremendous database, and uh, it's an incredible tool that you guys have today that I didn't have when I was your age, and I wish I had, but now I'm taking advantage of it. Um, but LinkedIn is is I would urge you to become very good at LinkedIn, become an expert at LinkedIn, and figure out how to navigate, figure out how to. And get involved. Get recommend people. Get recommendations. You want to have more than 500 contacts on there. You want to um, write articles on there. You do something called LinkedIn Pulse. You can demonstrate your domain knowledge and your differentiators by writing blog posts and putting it on LinkedIn Pulse. And use those updates. So if you see something interesting, you can link to it. And use it as an engagement vehicle. So engage with people that you're following or friends. And if someone posts an interesting article, you can comment on it. You can make, you know, because what's going on is people are actually seeing your comments. And then they'll want to connect with you. And then your profile is critical. You need a professional photo, detail on what you're really good at and your expertise. And don't just put down your jobs. Put down your jobs and what you achieved. So it's really, you look like a resume. So anyone coming for a meeting with you guys is going to search their LinkedIn profile, your LinkedIn profile, because that's just the way it's going on today. As an employer, you know, we, we make sure we, we, we do research on all of our candidates' social media. And um, not just LinkedIn, but Twitter, everything. It's Facebook. And, um, but, you know, LinkedIn is the most telling because it also shows who we are connected with jointly. And I can call people and say, hey, do you know... Adam, we you know Michael, you know, and it's a great, it's a tremendous value. So with that, I think the last page is my, um, yep, so those are my contact, contact uh, information. I'm, you know, I have office hours, as I mentioned. I'm happy to help any of you. I've met with some of you, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for, uh, for the opportunity to talk to you guys, and I guess we can open it up for questions. Yeah, right, Matt? Yeah. Matt's the boss. <laughs> so, okay, yes, Adam. Uh, if you wish you hadn't sold to ACS, and what was your role after you sold? Yeah, so um, financially, you could have made more money by not selling, but from um, a family standpoint, I married with three, at the time, three young kids, and I was on the road a lot. So I was the CEO of the company. We had nine centers around the country. My job was to go into each center four times a year. Plus, we had quarterly meetings in Las Vegas for my senior staff, plus customer visits. Most of our customers were on the West Coast. We were working with Microsoft and a lot of customers on the West Coast. So I was on the road a lot. 
So selling the business was driven by two main things. One, our second largest customer, Microsoft, we had 700 employees serving Microsoft. They said, we want you to move all these jobs to India within three years. So I was thinking, God, I gotta travel more, you know? Uh, so that kind of, and then I had, would have had to raise another four or five million dollars, which I didn't want to go through. So that was one driver. The other driver was, um, you know, we were traveling a lot, and, uh, and it was putting strain on the family. My, my business partner also had young kids. So I think we just realized, you know what, let's just, um, it's a good time to sell, let's try to exit. And the third reason we sold is we were very, our revenue concentration was more than half of one customer. And there were two other companies in our industry that had failed. That was a real wake-up call for me. That had concentration with one customer. And I'm like, I don't want to be like them. So we have an offer. We have, you know, we have an investor. They're back. They're letting us sell the company at this value. They think it's a good deal. Um, let's hire a broker, a banker, investment banker, and go to the market. And we got, yeah. If we didn't get a good price, we wouldn't have sold. We got a very fair and good price, I think. Yeah. Yes. The question that goes on with your exit. Um, so you talked about your company values and how you built. Yeah. And um, you know the employees that you brought on during that time probably wanted to work for a company in part because of those values. How did you see uh, uh, that shift when you sold? Were the employees did they stay pretty happy with how things went? We talked. We heard from one person a couple of weeks ago that basically all his employees were fired uh, after he sold the company. So how how did you say that transition worked out for your employees? Uh, the short answer is it worked out really well for them. But when we went to sell a company, part of the conditions we had were we wanted an all-cash deal at a premium to our peer group with no layoffs. Those are the three things I want. All-cash, premium, no layoffs. We got all-cash, we got a premium, and I got a verbal commitment from the executive vice president at ACS that he wouldn't do any layoffs. They kept the promise, no layoffs. They wound up, uh, for certain of our individuals that they were duplicative, they gave them offers in other parts of the company. So that kind of worked out in that way. And then post acquisition, so the company that bought us, ACS, was a public company. They had done something like 40 deals in the prior seven or eight years. So they were sort of an acquisition engine. So we monitored, we actually did some research on the companies that they had bought and see how did they deal with these companies. Did they gut these companies? Did they integrate? Turned out that they were very good at this integration thing and gave us a higher degree of confidence that our people, you know, there's nothing assured in life. <laughs> and uh, people talk all the time, right? And they don't deliver. But um, so we, you know, but our, our, our fear was a little bit mitigated by knowing that these guys had done a good job integrating the majority of their acquisitions. And we knew we had a great company. And I, I told, joked with um, ACS saying, my guys are gonna run their company someday because I was so confident in our executive team. They were so good. And every single one wanted to stay, stay. Um, and it turned out they wound up making more money, they got some bigger stock option awards. And, uh, were they happier? I don't know. But um, most of them, I think, were happier. And many of them are still there. So, yeah. Uh, Michael and then Emma. Uh, you said it was fifty thousand fifty dollars. You kind of heard that you also had sixty five employees. It was like a mismatch. Okay. Yeah. So that was at year nineteen ninety five. We started the business in the fall of ninety one. So we got to sixty five employees. That's that's a big lesson. It's like the first year we did around two hundred eighty thousand in revenue. So the three of us each put in fifty k in credit card debt. The chart. I didn't show you the very very beginning. But, so the chart you saw was ninety five. Um, and we had 65 employees. So it took us like three years to get there. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing about running a business is it starts really slow and it's just huge inertia and then eventually you, you get to take off. It's never like, you know, never, never like successful day one. It's a lot of grinding, it's a lot of iterating and feedback and figuring out where you're going and then, you know, eventually you get lucky and you get some breaks along the way and then you take off. And then a three-year contract was also 91? Yes, that's right. So that 280, most all of it was Pepco. Almost all of it, yeah. I guess. Sure. Yes, uh, Emma. Um, could you talk a little bit about your strategy uh, for when you first started the company and how you approached Pepco? I'm impressive that a company like Pepco would not only agree to do business with you, 
That that is a great um, question, and the truth is, I attribute Lady Luck. You know, we got lucky. Basically, we didn't approach Pepco because oh, we were did our homework and figured out Pepco is a perfect customer for us. It was more some of the people we hired. We had a Washington Post list of top 100 companies, and we just went down the list and called, and we somehow, you know, you call the switchboard. And then you got to find out, does someone make the decision for customer service or for outsourcing sales? And, you know, then the switchboard connects you to departments, and then you talk to the, you know, the executive assistant or secretary of the department, and then she has to tell you who's the right person there. And we got lucky. We, we found the right decision maker. They were, at the time, um, putting out a bid. They put an RFP out which was a simple RFP, three or four pages, and they were looking for an answer, a high-tech answering service. And, um, you know, back then, my partners and I, my partner and I, um, you know, we came from um, financial services and commercial real estate, where we were accustomed to doing these fancy books for, for presentation. Today, it's like, you know, it's done. But back then, this was rare. And uh, most of the proposals that were coming in were done typed with maybe with carpet paper and then stapled. No, no cover, no binding. But ours came in, in book form. And then when we went in and did our meeting with Pepco, we brought this stack of books and there were like five of us wearing suits. And we just knew that um, we were going to blow away the competitors because we had seen proposals from our competition just as part of our research. Um, and we knew that our proposal was just so much ahead of everyone else's. What we didn't know was that Pepco would be that impressed and that they wouldn't even come and do a site visit. They just basically gave us a contract. And uh, because of the perception of professionalism. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't tell them, hey, we're three guys in a garage, we're just starting out. You know, we acted bigger than we, you know, than we really were. But, you know, I wish I could say there's a grand strategy, but there wasn't. Yeah. You need luck. You really do. You need luck. Yes, Adriana. Um, so when you're talking about like the inertia and having to grind for a few years, like that just always seems so. Because I'm like so risk averse, but like, like scary. And so, how do you assess like this is worth grinding several years through to potentially get lucky versus, you know, maybe this isn't going to work out? And how do you think through those decisions? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. And that's one of the toughest things about being an entrepreneur is figuring out when to quit and when to pivot. You know, um, Facebook was a massive pivots. Uh, Living Social was successful for a period of time. Massive pivot. Every company is massive pivot. You know, they never, uh, they never wound up going in the path that they originally thought. And the key is, I think luck has a lot to do with it, but also if you're like Steve Jobs and you have this unique ability to sense the market, or Henry Ford, or whomever, you know, you can you dictate to the market and then you can go in a certain direction or you can react to the market and go in a certain direction. But, you know, because people tell you be persistent, be persistent. Mm -hmm. But I think the corollary to that should be like be persistent but open to ideas that would make you move a little bit. If you're persistent and rigid, you're going to fail eventually, you know. But if you look at it like you're a sailboat, you know, sailing from point A to point B, you never go straight. For those of you who say you tack, right? You're really going zigzags to get there, based on the wind and the, you know the tide and the current and things. So you know, I, I don't know. And it's so your question applies. There's so many variables to um, to consider that it would have to be situationally specific. I think to really be able to, to figure out how and when to. To, to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's key if you're an entrepreneur. You have to maintain an open mind at all times. You have to be very flexible at all times. And you have to be open to changes and um, shocks to your you know, market and system and disruption at all times. Because if you're not, then eventually you will get, you, you go under. Um, but what was your other question? Oh, about risk aversion. So the thing about risk aversion is, um, 
you know, lead generation company of its kind, it wasn't like, oh, you know, what if we fail and what if people reject that? You know, it was because we could feel the pain point ourselves so badly. That's why when I said earlier, you know, the best businesses are the businesses where you are the perfect customer for it, you know, because then you kind of know inside, top to bottom, that, yeah, this is the right move to do because this is what I as a customer would want. So, I don't know if I answered yeah. that. Guillermo? You know, along those lines, uh, we, we've heard other speakers talking about passion and stuff. Yeah. And you decided to start a company of something that you hate. <laughs> and you just saw the opportunity, uh, and that probably was your driver. But how was your decision to, okay, it's, it's something that was a big pain for me, that it must be a big pain for the company, and let's do it instead of just. I don't know, I was kind of... Well, yeah, you're response. asking two different questions. One is the pain point question, the other is the passion question. So I have a, kid, a son, and I became his Little League coach. Why? Because our current Little League coach was horrible. Not horrible, he's a good guy, but he just wasn't there, you know? And me, a couple parents and I decided, well, we'll be our own coach. That We saw a pain point, and we solved it. I wasn't not passionate about coaching baseball, I just wanted to... Do something. So the same thing in this business. You know, I didn't like making phone calls, but that doesn't mean that starting a business to do stuff that I don't like would be would be uh, I couldn't be passionate about. I'm passionate about excellence. You know, doing a great job for the customer and being creative for the customer. So that was sort of the mentality from the passion standpoint. Constantly raising the bar, constantly trying to be the best in our industry. You know, our company mission was to be the best run company of our size in the world. That's a huge, big, hairy, audacious thing, but it always kept, we knew we would never achieve it, so we just said, okay, what would the best company of our size do? Okay, that's what, we gotta keep going. So that was our passion, was just this constant striving for excellence, as opposed to, oh, we're, you know. And it was, uh, we knew that the pain point was bad, because we experienced it ourselves. Yeah. But uh, that's how I would differentiate your question. Yeah. You understand that, or yeah. is that okay? Yeah, Kelsey, did you have a question? Uh, no, no? okay. Mina, do you feel like there's anything you've missed not having worked in corporate America before trying to build something for corporate America? I did work in corporate America for oh, okay. uh, two and a half years. I worked for what is today CBRE, the big commercial real estate company. It was called Caldwell Banker back then. It was owned by Sears Roebuck. Is Sears even in business anymore? <laughs> I don't know, but Sears. Sears Roebuck was the publisher of these, you guys remember calendars? Uh, not calendar, uh, big catalogs? You do? I'm, I'm really dating myself. Sears used to mail out these seven, eight hundred page catalogs, like phone book size things, with pictures of clothing and sporting goods and everything. And you know, you'd get them around Christmas and then you'd pick up the phone and order. Anyway, so Sears owned Allstate Insurance, they owned Dean Witter Financial, which is now Morgan Stanley, they owned CBRE, the global banker. So I did work in corporate America, and I hated it. I hated it, the paperwork. I did get the Sears employee discount, though. So I'd go, yeah. I'd go to Sears and buy, like, you know, appliances and get a 15% discount. That was kind of nice, but I didn't like it. It was political, really bothered me. I found that in corporate America, it wasn't about merit, it was about politics and sucking up to a boss and getting favors from a boss and I didn't like that um, fundamentally I don't like that I'm more of a, I believe in meritocracy and um, it's just a it's just a feeling I got in that one experience that's the only company I worked for that was corporate America um, I won't say I hated it I met some great people some of my best friends in Washington were from that job so there were a lot of benefits to it but just from a st strictly professional Experience standpoint, um, you know, running your own business, being an entrepreneur, to me, it's just, it's no comparison. Yeah. Okay, Kelsey. All right, you ready? Yeah. Okay, good. Can you tell a little bit about your relationship with your co with your partners? Um, yeah. And did you you all came from real estate, but did you end up specializing in different aspects of the business? Or did you go yeah. Business and right. So there were three at the beginning. Uh, one was a stockbroker, and. One was a commercial real estate leasing agent, and I was a commercial real estate finance person. So I was like a mortgage, commercial mortgage broker. And the three of us were friends, and the three of us, you know, were 
when we started the company, we started talking about doing this business around the economy wasn't doing so well, but the real estate market was starting to tank. And you know, we'd get together every few weeks and say, hey, let's just do something. You know, let's. So we explored doing different things. Like one idea was let's renovate some townhouses. Another idea was um, buy a Jerry's uh, pizza franchise and get into the pizza business. Um, so we looked at a bunch of different ideas, and then I think one day we were sitting at Wendy's on Route 1 in Alexandria, and the idea came to us, like, you know, we all hate using the phone. Let's start a business. There's got to be other people that hate using the phone. Let's start a business where we can take that pain away. And then the light bulb went off, and we went from there. And the three of us, we picked titles out of a hat, and we were equal partners, a third, a third, a third, and we split up the, the, the work so there was that was one thing we did that was good is that we divided our divided our labor. Um, we were thoughtful about that. And the other thing was um, that the three of us agreed that since it was three, that a two-on-one um, situation could happen. So we agreed that uh, for any major decisions, that we would have to be unanimous in that decision. Otherwise, we wouldn't do that decision. We had a lot of late nights where we were debating until we compromised and the three of us were okay with it and then but that was a good thing we stuck to that three zero and then we wound up buying out Doug Pally and I wound up buying out our third partner um, maybe three or four years into it we had a difference of strategic direction so we bought out one of our partners so we wound up being two partners yeah JP yes mm -hmm. um, can you discuss how that, how that went down you know when there's three Situation two can make an offer for one, and that person, yeah, um, or it could, it could accept the double amount in the sense that one can buy out two. Was it that binding, or was it more of a formal discussion? It was, and we did not have a written buy sell agreement. It was all, first of all, the three of us were friends, that helped a lot. So we had a lot of mutual respect for each other, and we liked each other. So. The three founders were friends. That's a good thing. So I don't, I don't, I, I do believe that it's okay to do business with friends. Um, I know some people say don't do that, but it can work. I mean, in our case, it worked. And then, as far as the buyout goes, we just had a difference of opinion. So we just said, well, why don't we just buy you out? It wasn't anything formal or anything that was set in stone. We didn't have a buy sell agreement. And what what stage of the financing was this? Is this post? Oh, this is uh, this is when we were doing credit card debt. This is before we raised money. And so, so to keep a couple of questions. Um, how did you determine an evaluation at that point? Um, we did not hire a formal valuation. We, nego we just basically negotiated with our third partner and said, well, we think this is what the value is. And um, if you agree, we'll paper it up with the lawyers. And that, then we agreed. I think we were pretty fair about it. We looked at the deal, the, the company, and the risk factors, and the liabilities, and we'd sign leases and stuff. So you know, we agreed to accept some of his liabilities. Um, so it was a mix of things. And I think he wanted, he had things he wanted to do in his career. So um, you know, we tried to understand what each party wanted. And you know, the two of us that bought out our third partner, you know, we wanted to make this business really sustainable and keep reinvesting the profits in the company. So, you know, we came up, we didn't have a valuation expert, you know, called our accountants and, and talked to our lawyer and, yeah, it looks right, it looks about right, you know, so, you know, we didn't hire an investment banker. The company was really small at the time, too, so it wasn't, it wasn't a big transaction. But really, we were ignorant. We didn't know what we were supposed to do, you know, when, when you go and buy someone out. We had no idea. We just kind of got in a room and had a conversation. Are you still friends thereafter? Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. yeah, I would say so. I wouldn't say close friends, but you know, once in a while we uh, connect up. Yeah, Ramya. So, um, so you mentioned after someone in 2003 started with and I know you've had a couple other ventures. Where do you see kind of your vision for your career moving forward? I mean, do you want to just continue doing things like and connecting people and having your fingers on a lot of different ties, or do you think you'll start another? Yeah, I'm pretty opportunistic, you know, at a certain 
given what point I am. You know, right now my kids, I have two in college, one graduated college, one's in college, and one's almost out of college, so, or out of high school. So I feel like I can take on something bigger now, so we're looking to buy some an asset, a larger company uh, in the call center world. So I'm hoping that we can get something done in the next few months. Um, but yeah, I love the community building aspect of Connect Printer. It's not a money maker, but it's a great community builder. And we're putting people together. You know, we're starting to do some advisory work for our some certain clients. So that's could be a certain path we go. Part of it is, I guess, we'll see how the market takes it and uh, whether there's demand for it. So yeah, we don't have a grand plan. I guess just sort of um, do what you know, do what I like, do what we we think is is good at the moment. Just I'm curious about the law school story too. You, you mentioned yeah. that. <laughs> you mentioned that you yeah. 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 Yeah.
right on stuff that you're super interested in, or that you have really, really more knowledge about than anyone else, and become an expert in that little field, because that can go a long way. It's a differentiator. And as far as Twitter goes, um, Twitter, I, I get news from Twitter. I kind of get a, a pulse for things, like if I'm, I want to see how a team is doing on, you know, during a game, or you know, just the sentiment. It's great for like feeling the sentiment. And also Twitter, I mean uh, news. So sometimes if there's some news going on, I, it's definitely faster to go do hashtag search on Twitter than follow CNN.com or something like that. So I feel like it's a great news source. And it's a good place to, the reason I'm on Twitter is because most journalists are on Twitter. So if you want to maintain a relationship or follow journalists or have them follow you or whatever, Twitter's, you have to be on Twitter. But it's also kind of fun to see what people are saying. and. Um, yeah, but it's not really a strong business. For me, it's definitely LinkedIn is the majority of, you know, of, of the benefit of all these, of all these uh, platforms. So I would go, I'd go heavy on LinkedIn if I were you, definitely. So, um, I think yes. I'm just, I, like, following up that, like, I'm sure I'm in the minority here, but I kind of think LinkedIn's a little bit of a scam. Like, I, like, I, <laughs> I have a profile. Uh -huh. I mean, it's sort of my resume. Yep. Like, I, I don't like. I don't really know what it does. I mean, I I've got like my my network of 500 plus. Mm -hmm. But frankly, like, I have a bunch of first degree connections that don't mean anything to me. Um, and I I would consider like the people that I could like write on the whiteboard right now to be like the real people I'm connected with in life who are actually my network. Um, so I know there's like a professional aspect to it. There's reaching yeah. out to people, but like, so I so I, I have it because it seems like the right thing to do. Yes. And I've used it for sales calls to like yes. ping people. Yep. Perfect. That seems like kind of annoying. Like I'm not like it's not like building a network. So I'm I'm just kind of like curious. Um, one like to the class and like what other people think, and like two, uh, like how you think it's going to work and why you think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. What? Who else has had, has an opinion? On LinkedIn, too. What your thoughts on LinkedIn? So, this is, yeah, this is perfect. Yeah. So I work at LinkedIn. I'm okay. So my very strong feelings about LinkedIn. So I feel like every social network has their own thing of what they look for. And so LinkedIn is trying to be more of an inspirational. So it's like, you know, you go on there. It's not just about, like, who you're connected with or whatever. But it's also, I, I used to, before I, you know, work with them at boards, I spent a lot of time there. And, was like false, and everything that was there to see what people are doing, but also the people and the opportunities of friends to know through it. It's like, oh, I read this interesting article that you liked that I should have put a feed and kind of like showed me another place. And I kind of just like this inception kind of thing. I spent a lot of hours on LinkedIn, but because it started from one thing, the feed, right? And so if you have Facebook now, it's all like videos of like buzz feed stuff, like the algorithm change. And so a lot of it is what you see on the platform, but also to me, LinkedIn isn't just. About like oh I'm gonna ask you for a job. It's more like you know what skill can I build with the certifications, but also we thought leadership and the influencers and the network there. But also to see like if I'm curious about a job in like corporate strategy, right? Going down the line, who from Georgetown on the matter? What did they do? What was their path? What they called leadership? Like what did they do? So I can kind of be inspired to kind of follow their path. Like I did that when I was a first year. I kind of seeing what the second years did to get to where they are. So it's more like a inspiration I think I think in business a lot of us get really disappointed and a lot of like discouraged because you see people get jobs or whatever and you're like starting to doubt yourself because everybody it's like a big promo moment. Uh -huh. I feel like LinkedIn is kind of a nice like you can do it too kind of thing. Um, yeah. Kind of Interesting. Thing, so. Right. Yeah. But LinkedIn is like having as you said it's like people can it to like people Do you like do you like that or do you not like that? Um like I don't know so I like the Aspect of being off, like an option. It's not. I think people think they only go to LinkedIn to switch jobs or to look for jobs. I think it's more of a platform to learn and grow and see what. And also, I used to use Twitter a lot as well. I'm a heavy Twitter user, but then it started leaning more towards LinkedIn because it's more substantial, long-form blogs and content. So Twitter was more like one-off condensed version, but like LinkedIn was more thought leadership. So not only do you can blog and write about it, but just to show who you are. It's more than just a resume, because I think resume is just bullet points, but here you have way more like, real estate in your profile to kind of do multimedia. Yeah, you can post the uh, PowerPoints, yeah. you can post.
videos. Um, but is the idea that like I can get a job on LinkedIn, or is it just that I'm like a thought leadership I, platform? It's, it's like everything. So it's kind of that wall gardener approach where like Facebook wanted you to stay on Facebook, right? And so Google wants to like go out. And so like LinkedIn was for a long time um, trying to make you stay in their APIs and everything. It was very like close off. And so as of this week, <laughs> they made you a conference. They kind of like opened that out to do that so that you'll want to leave, but like they made a lot of strategic acquisitions, like Linda, Pulse, just so that you can get to know more than just get a job. So a lot of do with like, would you pay like 35 a month for like premium? Probably not. It depends what you want. Like if you're job seeking, maybe. But I think it's more than just yeah. I think just like knowing how to do it. You have to become, like Tiffany's saying, it's a great resource. It's a, it's a library of content that uh, long form, short form, video, Big videos, small videos, whatever. Um, you can follow people like Bill Gates and others. Big influencers are on there. You can follow them and learn from them. It's a great learning. It's a great learning platform. B two B learning platform too. And you know, it's great for solicitation too. Not just for jobs, but if you're looking for investors, Ramya. You know, for your business, um, if you're looking, you know, the Wedding Wire guys got Martha Stewart to invest in them using LinkedIn. They sent a LinkedIn to Martha's people. They responded. They got capital. So, I mean, it works. It definitely works. Um, anyone else with an opinion on LinkedIn, good or bad, or different? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, only, there's so much, only so much on LinkedIn in the view, um, where it's just like not natural. You can't just email people, like, hey, John, this is Sam. I'm John, are you guys, you know, working out? At the end of the day, you're gonna, you can use that as a platform to connect with someone, but you're gonna have to go meet them, have drinks with them, and actually make a real connection. If you make a real connection, then they can open up some crazy doors for you. But you're not gonna have some like real doors open up like that um, off the connection, or you're right. selling yourself short if you're just gonna do it through email. So you do have to make It's not a substitute connection. for human to human, face to face, right? It's not a substitute, but it's a supplement. Yeah. In fact, it's a great supplement. Like after you meet someone for that coffee or that lunch, you can then start following them on LinkedIn or vice versa. You connect with them on LinkedIn, you learn more about that person. You know, so you can learn more about them beforehand and then afterwards you can maintain that. You know, what are your thoughts? Are you, okay, are we done? Okay. You're probably more unemployed than all the <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it.